Now, there are um, many different ways we could define Christianity today. However, Christianity primarily, at its core, uh, is about a relationship. A relationship between God and his people uh, that the work of the cross uh, restored. However, because God is spirit, uh, the way in which uh, God and his people communicate in this relationship uh, works quite differently. Um, Tim Keller, uh, in his book on prayer, illustrates really well how this communication works. He says this, quote, Prayer is continuing a conversation that God has started through his word, which eventually becomes a full encounter with him. It is a two-way communicative interaction. Therefore, communication with God always starts with his word. God communicates to us through his word, and then we communicate back to God uh, in prayer. Uh, That is why the word of God is so important for us to be constantly reading, uh, because in it, God is trying to communicate to us. And therefore, like any relationship, when we start to lose contact with the other person, uh, we can start to become a little bit forgetful uh, and lose a little bit of sight on, on who they are uh, and what they are like at times. Uh, and that is why we can all attest to the fact that when we Christians are not soaking ourselves in God's word, we too can become forgetful uh, and lose a little bit of sight on who our God is and what he is like at times, which causes us during these times to even conclude things about God's character um, that are sometimes just not true. For example, we Christians sometimes paint God as a, um, a God who is distant from us at times, a God who wonders why he puts up um, with our baggage at times, uh, a God who um, gets tired of helping us all the time, or maybe a God who we fear maybe has even given up on us because we continue to mess up over and over again. And on the other hand, there are non-Christians who conclude things about God's character uh, that is just even more wrong. Uh, For example, a lot of non-Christians think that God hates them uh, or that they have to become more morally good before God even thinks about loving them. Uh, And that is why this passage that we're coming to today is so great. Because in it, God is communicating to us what his heart is actually like towards all people. A passage that shows that his heart yearns for the salvation of all people. A heart that yearns for all of us to make it and endure all the way uh, to the very end. Uh, But before we can get to that conclusion, we need to first unpack this um, passage in detail in order to help us to get to that conclusion. So let's, uh, let's do that now, starting in verse 21. Verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Okay, so Jesus and his disciples are approaching the shore of the lake in Capernaum by boat. And verse 21 here says that a large crowd were there waiting for Jesus to arrive so that they could welcome him back to Capernaum uh, again. But this was no ordinary large crowd. This crowd was so large that when Jesus' boat eventually lands at the shore and he hops out of the boat, Luke chapter 8, verse 42 says that, quote, the crowds almost crushed him. And even later on that same day, when Jesus was even walking through Capernaum, uh, Mark tells us in verse 24, later on in this passage, that this crowd was, quote, pressed around him on every side. A crowd that was so big that Jesus could hardly seem to have any room to even breathe here in Capernaum. This was the the size of the crowd that were there on the shore of this lake as they were waiting for Jesus' boat to approach them on this day. What we then see as we keep reading is that once Jesus and his disciples arrive, climb out of this boat and step onto the shore of this lake, uh, a synagogue leader uh, named Jairus, who was a a very um, man of very high standing uh, in this culture, uh, pushed his way through the crowd uh, and he fell on his feet, at Jesus' feet, and he begged Jesus to come with him to heal his dying daughter. Jesus then stops and immediately agrees to help, and they therefore both start rushing over towards Jairus' house so they can get there before Jairus' daughter dies. And as you can imagine, this huge crowd are right there following beside them. 
However, while everyone is, is rushing over towards Jairus' house, uh, this passage all of a sudden introduces us to a woman. And it is this woman's story who we'll be focusing uh, our attention on for the remainder of today. Verse 25. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. Now, back here in the first century, the Jews were commanded to obey what was called uh, the clean and unclean laws. Uh, The clean and unclean laws were initially instituted by God in the Old Testament in order to distinguish the Israelites uh, from the surrounding nations so that they could be set apart uh, as God's holy people. Uh, For example, a a person was deemed unclean if they ate a particular food um, or if they touched a dead body um, or if they had a particular skin disease Um, Or, like in this woman's case here, if a woman had menstrual bleeding. And what happened when a person was deemed unclean was that they were actually separated uh, uh, from God's holy people. They weren't allowed to be part of God's holy people and they therefore legally had to live outside of the community uh, of God's people. And they were even forbidden uh, from coming into the temple of God to worship God uh, with the rest uh, of the community. And this was their status for a set period of time until they could be made ceremonially clean again. And for women who had their monthly menstrual bleeding, um, the law tells us that they were deemed unclean for seven days until they could be made ceremonially uh, clean again. However, for this woman, this was not your normal monthly menstrual bleeding. Verse 25 says that this woman was, quote, Subject to bleeding for 12 years. Therefore, this woman for the past 12 years has had a disease. A disease that causes constant bleeding. Therefore, what does the law have to say about this uh, particular disease? Um, Well, Leviticus chapter 15 verse 25 tells us. Leviticus 15 25. When a woman has a discharge of blood for many days at a time, other than her monthly period, she will be unclean as long as she has the discharge. Therefore, according to this, for the past 12 years of this woman's life, she was deemed unclean that whole time. What did that mean for this woman's lifestyle? Well, let's continue reading. Leviticus 15, 26 to 27. Any bed she lies on while her discharge continues will be unclean, as is her bed during her monthly period. And anything she sits on will be unclean, as during her period. Anyone who touches them will be unclean. Therefore, anything this woman touches was deemed unclean, and anyone who touched her was also deemed unclean. Therefore, for the past 12 years, one... This woman would have had to live outside of the community of God's holy people by herself. Two should have been forbidden from coming uh, anywhere near any other person, even if they were family and friends. Three should have been forbidden from coming into the temple of God in his presence to worship him uh, with the rest of the community. And four, she, she most likely would have been looked down upon as an outcast for 12 years by virtually everyone in the community. This woman's status in a first century Jewish culture was was literally as low as you can get it, similar to a, a leper. We can safely conclude that for the past 12 years, this woman's life has been nothing but misery. She was not touched. She was not hugged. She was not loved. She was on her own. Very sad. Therefore, this... Disease that she had is, is not some small inconvenience. Uh, now, this is, a, this is a big deal for this woman. Therefore, she, this woman would, would have done anything, anything, to become ceremonially clean again. She would have done anything uh, so that she could be free um, of this disease. That is why we see here next in verse 26 how desperate she is to find a cure for her disease. Verse 26 tells us that she, quote, spent all she had. She spent all the money she had on doctors. However, verse 26b, quote, Instead of getting better, she grew worse. This bleeding disease seems to be incurable. 
Therefore, at this stage, she is most likely given up uh, on all hope. However, she then hears news about this uh, new man in town, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, who is claiming to be God's Messiah. This man, Jesus, is literally her last hope. Uh, Therefore, despite being forbidden by law from coming into the community of people with her uncleanness, uh, this woman, however, is so desperate to see Jesus that she just goes ahead and breaks the law anyway and comes into the community of people. Uh, And as she enters, she all of a sudden sees this huge crowd that were pressed around Jesus as they continued to walk towards Jairus' house. Therefore, this woman um, catches up to this crowd. Uh, She slips herself into the middle of this large crowd so that she can get herself to Jesus. How confident is this woman that Jesus will heal her? Very confident. Verse 28. If I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. I will be healed. She has faith that Jesus is who he says he is. She has faith that that Jesus has the power to heal her uh, of this disease. And it is this faith that is the engine that drives her to push her way through this huge crowd so that she can get closer uh, to Jesus. And then what we see next is that she actually gets herself squeezed into a position where she is literally within an arm's length distance behind Jesus amongst this huge crowd. Now, you would think at this stage this woman would maybe call out to Jesus or or yell out to Jesus and and ask Jesus to heal her, wouldn't you? Um, But what we see here is that she doesn't plan to do that. She instead plans to secretly reach out, touch the back of Jesus' clothes and be healed that way. And based on what we know about this woman, it, it, it makes sense why she doesn't want to call out to Jesus. Uh, Because with her current status in society, she probably doesn't feel worthy enough or important enough uh, of Jesus' time and attention. She probably doesn't want to bother Jesus um, with her shameful condition. Another reason why she probably doesn't want to call out to Jesus is because that would ruin her disguise. Uh, She knows that if she calls out to Jesus, she knows if she yells out to Jesus, that would bring attention to herself. Uh, And the crowd would immediately recognize her and immediately kick her out of this crowd because of her uncleanness. Therefore, because of these reasons, this woman's plan of attack is to secretly reach out, touch the back of Jesus' clothes, and be healed without Jesus and without any of the crowd knowing about it. And what we see is that she does exactly this. She reaches out, touches the back of Jesus' clothes, and then, verse 29, immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. After 12 years, 12 years, um, of that constant feeling of blood flow, that feeling was now gone. And oh, how relieved she would have been as soon as she felt it. Um, This is because not only is she now free from the physical pain uh, and the physical tiredness that this disease caused her, but because also she can now join the community of people again. She can now join her family and friends again. She can now be touched and hugged again. She can now legally be married again. She can now join the temple worship again with the rest of the community. Most of all, she can now be free from the loneliness that this uncleanness, this disease caused her. For this woman, this this healing is everything for her, everything for her. And just as she thinks that she has now just been miraculously healed, without anybody else knowing about it, we then read this in verse 30. Verse 30. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? Now, first of all, what we need to note is that Jesus' power is not some charged battery that people can just um, plug in and take advantage of without Jesus' blessing. Jesus' 
Um, This is because verse 31 literally says that many people, many people were in this moment pressing up against Jesus. Many people were touching Jesus and yet nothing uh, miraculous happened to them. Uh, No, God perceived the significance of this one woman's touch. It was a touch of faith. And therefore God, recognising this, was actively willing to um, honour this woman's faith by healing her through Jesus. And therefore, because Jesus recognises that the Spirit's power had just gone out from him, he therefore turns around, faces this large crowd, and he calls out for this one person who had touched him to come forward. Quote, who touched my clothes, he says. But then what we see is that initially, no one comes forward, not one person. But Jesus doesn't give up his pursuit. Verse 32. Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Now, there's actually a bit of a debate today over this particular uh, part of the passage. Um, Some well-respected commentators believe that Jesus knew this whole time who it was who touched him. Uh, While there's actually still many other well-respected commentators who believe that Jesus genuinely didn't know who it was uh, who touched him uh, in this moment. Uh, Now, to be able to understand um, which interpretation is correct, it's helpful to have a little bit of an understanding uh, about the person of Jesus. Um, We all know, for instance, that Jesus is both fully God uh, and fully human. Uh, Therefore, Jesus has two different natures, a divine nature and a human nature. We all know that Jesus' divine nature knows all things. We cannot deny that as Christians. However, his human nature does not know all things because his human nature is just like our human nature. And therefore, what we see when we read through the Old Testament, uh, the New Testament um, is that there are actually certain times where Jesus genuinely doesn't know certain things because his divine nature hadn't revealed it to his human nature. Uh, For example, Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, quote, But about that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now, of course, Jesus' divine nature knows when the day or hour of judgment day will be. This is because um, all three members of the Trinity know all things. Therefore, what Jesus is saying here in this verse in Matthew is that his human nature didn't know the day or hour of judgment day because his divine nature hadn't revealed this to his human nature. This is because when Jesus came into this, uh, came into this world uh, and started his ministry, he purposely limited himself of some of his divine privileges so that he could fully experience being human just like us. However, despite that, There are still many times in the New Testament where we see that Jesus actually does know certain things because his divine nature did, in fact, communicate it to his human nature um, for specific purposes. Uh, One example is when Nathaniel was under the fig tree um, all by himself back in uh, John uh, chapter 1. And what we uh, see there uh, is that Jesus claims to actually have seen Nathaniel there even though he wasn't physically there. And he was even able to reveal certain things to Nathaniel that only someone who was there by the fig tree in that moment could have known about. Therefore, in this moment, it is clear that only Jesus' divine nature could have known this fact. Uh, And therefore, it's clear here that in this moment, um, Jesus' divine nature did uh, communicate this to his human nature. Therefore, based on this knowledge about the person of Jesus, it could very well be either interpretation. It's it's hard to tell for sure which interpretation is correct. Both interpretations are both um, biblically accurate possibilities. Um, However, the interpretation that I'm leaning more towards is the interpretation that says that Jesus genuinely didn't know who um, who touched him uh, in this moment. This is because the language in this passage seems to express genuine ignorance within Jesus. Um, For example, verse 30. Who touched my clothes? And then again in verse 32, Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. 
Therefore, I find it very hard to believe that Jesus would fake or pretend being so ignorant to something um, when in fact he knew uh, who it was that whole time. However, despite this, this passage still makes it clear that Jesus still knew at least three things. Uh, one, Jesus knew that power had gone out from him. Uh, two, Jesus, know that the, Jesus knows that this person was healed by that power. Uh, and three, Jesus knows that this uh, touch was a deliberate act out of faith in him. And therefore, because Jesus senses this partic- particular person's faith, it um, creates this eagerness within Jesus to speak to this person. Verse 32 again. Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. He looked around and he kept looking around. And because Jesus doesn't give up his pursuit, verse 33 says this, quote, Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. Now, this woman's fear here would have an element of godly fear in it, a a, a godly fear that is just in awe of Jesus' glory in Jesus' power and what he has just done. It would have an element of godly fear in that. However, it's also safe to say that her fear also most likely included a a, a frightening fear of how Jesus might react. Uh, After all, she had just broken the law by coming into the community of people. And she not only just um, made many people in the crowd unclean by touching a whole lot of them, but she also touched Jesus without his consent. Anyone in Jesus' shoes in this moment would have been furiously angry with her uh, in this first century Jewish culture. And therefore, she probably thought that Jesus might react in this exact same way. Therefore, she was trembling with fear. She still came forward, head down, fell at Jesus' feet and, quote, told him the whole truth. She would have told him about her condition. She would have told him about why she broke the law. She would have told him everything. What we are seeing here throughout this passage so far with this woman is that she is doing exactly what I mentioned at the start. She's concluding things about Jesus' character that is just not true. And maybe you can relate to her. Maybe you too, like this woman, don't feel like, or you feel like a a social um, outcast in society today who Jesus wouldn't care about. Maybe you too, like this woman, don't feel like you're worthy enough or moral enough or important enough of Jesus' time and attention. Or maybe you too, like this woman, Um, don't feel like Jesus overly cares about you or your salvation. Or or maybe you don't feel like you can relate much to this woman at all, but maybe you can relate more to those other questions that I mentioned uh, at the very start of today. But but whichever is true for you, uh, please stay with me for the next 10 minutes as we uh, encounter Jesus' heart towards this woman, the heart that he has for all people. After this woman tells Jesus the whole truth, Jesus responds to her as this, verse 34. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Now this statement from Jesus here is actually not primarily about her physical disease. No, this this statement from Jesus here is mainly about her spiritual salvation. How can we know this? Uh, Three reasons. First reason, Jesus called her daughter. Now, seeing as this woman has had a bleeding disease for 12 years, we can all do the math and conclude that this woman, uh, at the very least, is only slightly younger than Jesus, if not the same age or even older than Jesus. Therefore, the reason why Jesus calls her daughter here. Um, is clearly because she is now a a daughter of God, a a child of God. Second reason, Jesus' reference to her faith. 
Now, Jesus' reference to her faith as the the means to her healing clearly implies a healing beyond just the physical healing. It it implies a a spiritual healing as well. Uh, And the final reason, reason number three, Jesus' words go in peace. Jesus doesn't just throw this phrase around carelessly. Uh, We all know that Jesus' definition of peace in the Bible is always peace with God. Uh, There is no such thing as peace in Jesus' eyes if a sinner is not at peace with God. Therefore, because of this woman's faith, she is now at peace with God forever. Verse 34 again. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Now we all know why. Jesus persisted to find this woman in the crowd. It it wasn't so that he could get angry at her. Uh, It wasn't so that he could tell her off. And and again, it wasn't so that he could have an encounter with her about her physical disease. No. Jesus persisted and persisted and persisted to find this woman so that he could bring her in to his kingdom. Bring her in to be a daughter of God, a child of God. Bring her in to be his Uh, How eager he was to to comfort her with that news. Uh, How eager he was to find this woman so that he could say these words to her. Verse 34, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. As soon as Jesus saw that faith within the touch of this one woman, he did everything he could to find her in the crowd, uh, which is incredible. Because Jesus and Jairus are are actually in this moment in a rush to get to Jairus' daughter, to get to Jairus' house before his daughter dies. This was a a real-life emergency. Jesus was far too desperate to have an encounter with this woman to even think about that. Verse 30 says that he looked around for her. And even when that didn't work, it says that he kept looking around. He looked around and he kept looking around. And he wouldn't have stopped until he could have an encounter, a real-life encounter with this woman. This is how eager Jesus is to have an encounter with each and every one of us living in this world today and bring us all into salvation. What is even more amazing is that this woman wasn't even seeking to find salvation from her sin. All she wanted was to be healed of her physical disease. All she wanted was to be made ceremonially clean again. That's all she wanted. But Jesus saw her faith, and he therefore went out of his way to find her and still save her from her sins anyway. We also saw this back in in Mark chapter 2 with the paralyzed man. All that man wanted from Jesus was to be healed of his paraplegia. Again, that's what he wanted from Jesus. But again, Jesus saw his faith. And still went out of his way to say these words to this man. Mark chapter 2, verse 7. Son, your sins are forgiven. This, again, is how eager Jesus is for our salvation. Therefore, it's no surprise then to see in Luke 15, um, Jesus rejoicing when just one sinner repents and comes into his kingdom. Uh, It's also no surprise to see in Luke chapter 19, Jesus physically weeping with tears when these people in front of him were rejecting his message uh, of salvation. This is because this is how much he cares. This is how much Jesus cares. Even if you, like this woman, may be the lowest of all lows in society today, then this is still how much his heart yearns for you and your salvation. And if you're a Christian here today, then this is how much Jesus' heart yearns for you to make it and endure all the way to the very end. He will not give up on you. And it makes sense, doesn't it, why Jesus cares this much. Let's just say there is this doctor um, who worked for years and uh, and sacrifice much to find a, a cure for cancer. And he puts his life on hold for it. He, he quits his job for it. 
He puts all of his life savings into it. He, he, he uh, puts all of his spare time into it, all so that he could do everything he can to find this cure for cancer. And now if this doctor is willing to sacrifice that much to just find this one cure for cancer, then how much joy would this doctor have? How eager would this doctor be to see his cure bring healing to all people dying of cancer? No doctor sacrifices that much if they didn't passionately care about cancer patients. But what we see here is that Jesus was willing to sacrifice so much more than this doctor ever did. He was willing to sacrifice glory in heaven. He was willing to sacrifice eternal pleasures in paradise forever. All so that he could come down into this world, into our mess, to suffer and die horrific death on the cross for our sins, all so that he could purchase his cure for us. The cure that will bring salvation to all people in this world. Now, if Jesus was willing to sacrifice that much just to find this cure, then how much more joy would Jesus have than this doctor? How much more eager would Jesus be than this doctor ever was to see his cure, bring salvation to even his most, even to all his enemies here in this world today? How much more? Therefore, all we now have to do in response today is to do exactly what this woman does. This woman was unclean, separated from the community of God's holy people, forbidden from coming into the presence of God in his temple. However, it is her faith in Jesus that is the thing that makes her clean again and brings her back in again. What we're seeing right here is that this is the physical representation of how we are spiritually saved. This is because the clean and unclean laws, according to the Bible, were always ultimately supposed to point us to what sin does. Sin, according to the Bible, is the ultimate unclean. Therefore, our sin today is what makes all of us, like this woman, spiritually unclean for life. Our sin is what ultimately separates us from God's holy people. Our sin is what ultimately forbids us from coming into his presence in heaven. Spiritually, we are this woman. We are all spiritual outcasts. And therefore, our only hope of being made clean from our sins again is to do exactly what this woman does. And that is to reach out and grab hold of this cure that Jesus is offering and put our faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus is how any of us, the only way that any of us can be saved today.